Jean-Michel Casabon, a man of French and African descent, an artist whose people came to Trinidad two centuries ago, has left to us a rich archive of pictures, a vivid recollection of a time long past. The development of Trinidad began in earnest towards the close of the 18th century. The Cedula Act, published on the 24th of November, 1783, attracted Catholic colonists, Creole families of the French islands, both black and white, whose plantations had been ravaged by insects and the political turmoil of the period. By the arrival of the British in 1798, Trinidad had been developed considerably. Its population, already multiracial, was taking advantage of the unique rights guaranteed by the Cedula of Population, these rights having been further endorsed in the Articles of Surrender to the British. The Casabon family had its roots in the south. Like many other free-colored families, they settled in the Naparimas. Jean-Michel Casabon, the son of François Casabon, was born at Montrose Estate, Chagornes, in 1814. His father, François, a colored man, perhaps born a slave, was by all evidence an intelligent and well-educated person. He was kidnapped in his native Martinique by the captain of the French frigate Calypso and sold into slavery in Trinidad. Redeemed by a subscription that was raised on his behalf by members of the free black and colored population, Francois Casabon gained his freedom and married into a well-known and respected colored family of the Naparimas. He developed Montrose estate, owning in his turn some 33 slaves. In 1823, when he was nine years of age, Jean-Michel left the pleasant hills of Naparima to attend St. Edmund's College at Ware in England. As a young man, he ventured to France and in Paris first studied medicine. He soon gave that up and started to paint under the guidance of Monsieur Paul de la Roche. He won the coveted Prix de Rome and lived and worked for four years at the famous Villa Medici at the expense of the French government. He returned to Trinidad in June 1847 with his French wife and two young daughters. He was 33 years of age. In 1851, Casabon had published 18 lithographs of Trinidad scenes. Some 200 copies of these were published. When the Trinidadian artist Michel Casabon painted Port of Spain Harbour in the 1850s, Independence Square, now some distance from the sea, was the waterfront. From the end of Frederick Street, a jetty 700 feet long extended into the sea. The Roman Catholic Cathedral is one of the several landmarks which can be identified. Here is the lighthouse at the foot of Frederick Street, And in the background is a spire of the Trinity Cathedral. Port of Spain had by now become a very busy city, filled with the sounds of patois, the language of the people. Their dress was the dress of the French West Indian Islands. Fort San Andres is now as it was then. It was built to prevent unauthorized landings on the jetty and is now the traffic branch of the police service. At the foot of St. Vincent Street was the wharf where schooners came alongside to discharge their cargoes. 
the center of the picture, at the corner of King and St. Vincent's Street, was the Custom House and Bond. This area was known as the Stinking Corner and was reclaimed in 1906. Even though the lithographs are only 7 inches by 11 inches, Casabon achieved a remarkable degree of detail, as seen here. Whites, blacks and coloreds mixed freely in this cosmopolitan society. The construction of this handsome stone edifice in the Gothic style was begun in 1818 under the direct supervision of Sir Ralph Woodford, then Governor of Trinidad. Situated south of Brunswick Square, now Woodford Square, the church was opened for divine service as a church on Trinity Sunday, 1823. In 1817, there was only one church in Port of Spain, which stood on the site now occupied by Tamron Square. This lithograph shows us that the sea came up almost to the walls of the church in the early days. This early church was dedicated to the Virgin Mary under the name of the Immaculate Conception. Sir Ralph Woodford decided to replace this simple structure with a church more suited to the needs of the growing population, and it was decided to change the site and to erect the new church to the west of the old one. The foundation stone was laid in 1816. Though still incomplete, it was opened for use in 1832 as the old church was falling down. Twin stone towers were planned, but had to be replaced by wooden towers because of weakness in the structure. These are first government buildings were designed by Richard Bridgens, superintendent of public works and built in 1848. The buildings contain the offices of the governor and colonial secretary, as well as the council chamber and the law courts. In 1897, the buildings were given a coat of red paint, and the public ever after refer to them as the Red House. This, the ancestor of our present Red House, was completely gutted by fire on the 23rd of March, 1903, during the water riots. This beautiful lithograph shows the Maraval Weir, situated on the river just above the present Andalusia. Prior to 1820, the British governors occupied houses in Port of Spain at Brunswick, now Woodford Square, and Marine, now Independence Square. The old estate house of the Pechier family had been largely pulled down and reconstructed in 1820 and had become the official residence of the governor. Because Governor Woodford was an eligible bachelor, the women of the town would walk in front of Government House and shake their bustle to attract his attention. In 1817, Governor Woodford purchased from the heirs of Madame Pechier 232 acres of land comprising the Paradise Estate and which today forms the Queen's Park Savannah. In 1854, the Grand Stand was erected. The Pechier family and their descendants retained burial rites in the cemetery situated in the center of the Savannah. St. James Barracks was erected in the years 1824 to 1827. Between 1830 and 1850, it had housed a company of 1st West India Regiment, locally known as the Black Soldiers, in their picturesque Zouave uniforms and one or two companies of British soldiers, pictured here in their regimental wear, bearskins, scarlet jackets and black trousers. These magnificent bamboo arches stood near the site of the St. Anne's Amerindian Mission, founded by the Spanish Capuchin priests at the close of the 17th century. Apart from landscapes, Casabon painted portraits of many of his contemporaries. This is a fine example of an oil done by Casabon one of the very few in existence. This watercolor is possibly a watercolor of the father of the man in the oil painting. William Hardin Burnley, seen in this photograph of a painting, was a patron of Casabon. 
The Orange Grove estate, one of his plantations, was typical of the sugar plantations in Trinidad about the middle of the 19th century. Burnley, born in the United States, was Trinidad's first millionaire, and at the time of emancipation in 1838, owned more than one twentieth of all the slaves in Trinidad, and also a small fleet of ocean-going ships. The residence depicted in the painting was built by him in 1835 for his wife. Now known as Trinidad Sugar Estates Limited, Orange Grove is responsible annually for about 6% of the total sugar production. The estate residence shown in the painting has been completely demolished. An original watercolor, this cane cutter was perhaps a worker on Burnley's Orange Grove estate. In the background, we can see the sugar factory. This charming watercolor of a marchand typifies Casabon's fascination with La Belle Creole. Mount Tamana is named after the Tamanac Indians found in the Lower Orinoco and in Trinidad. Arima village was founded in 1759 as a mission settlement for Amerindians who were grouped around its church dedicated to St. Rose of Lima, the first saint of South America. The Tamarack Indians had a lengthy Genesis myth about a deluge in which a man and a woman saved themselves by climbing to the top of a high mountain called Tamanaka and miraculously created a new human race from the fruit of the Mauritius palm. In the 1850s, a bridal path went from Arima to the east coast. It was a two-day trip for good walkers, but might take much longer as the rivers were unbridged and quite impassable in the rainy season. A track passed through Mount Tamana where the traveler or hunter could spend the night in the cottage. This was probably the route followed by the Tamanac Indians in 1699 after the murder of the three Capuchin missionaries and the governor and his party at San Francisco de la Arena, present-day San Rafael. The Spaniards finally caught and executed them on the east coast in 1700. In Mount Tamana stood a cedar tree thousands of years old. The artist is probably Casabon himself. His hunting party included Lord Harris, perhaps, the man in the top hat. Maracas waterfall lies in the shadow of Tucuche, Trinidad's second highest mountain, which was known as Mount Maracas, and on which there was a lookout post to forewarn the inhabitants of St. Joseph of any attacks by the English or by pirates. A number of excellent poems are written in its praise, inspired by the sight of its clear, cool waters. Breaking in droplets to float in the gust, which scatters the grains of the liquid dust, so the rays of the sun at misty morn, with a thousand rainbows, the rocks adorn. The cascade from French cascade, a small waterfall, or more correctly, a broken waterfall, is still to be found at the very top of the Cascade Valley, though now much reduced in volume and its pool replaced by a reservoir. From the north post, situated on the ridge at the head of the Diego Martin Valley, an excellent view could be had of any ships approaching the north coast of Trinidad and the Bocas. The rugged, forested north coast of Trinidad is partly faulted and submerged, resulting in the wild and beautiful aspect portrayed by the painter. Shodo Island, remembered in Russell's Legend of the Bocas, tells us of a sukuya there that slept away the blessed day. It wrought ill all the night. A ball of flame along it came, flying without a wind. Casabor must have enjoyed the splendid sunsets, the western sky ablaze as in this wonderful watercolor. Trinidad's north coast stretches from Point Monas on the northwestern end 
to Toko Point, also known as Recife, or reefs, at the northeastern end. In days of old, this was called the Coast of Hierro, or Iron, and an iron coast it may have been to the sailing ships that might have sought shelter there. Signals were transmitted by flags and balls from the North Post Signal Station to Fort George, and then to another station just north of the Customs House, thus providing a day's advance notice of the coming of ships to Port of Spain. The first safe harbor going east from Point Monas, once called Marabal, is now Macarip, and just beyond is a tiny cove called Sodo, a waterfall of some 15 feet. Creole bells enjoy the afternoon cool as the westerning sun creates dappled patterns with the shadows, a watercolor of particular subtlety reflecting the genius of the man Jean-Michel Casabon. The Paria main road, a bridle track which passes over the mountains above Macquarie Bay, must have provided for Casabon many a vantage spot. And in this watercolor, and the one following, both called Views of Macquarie, the splendor of the sea and sky are splashed with shades of immortelle and puy, hot vermilion, and cadmium yellow. An old brass cannon, perhaps a signal gun, once lay across the trail. It now lies at the bottom of the cliffs, and by now may well have been taken away by the sea. H.M.S. Druid was painted in oils. Casabon, noted as a watercolorist, also did work in egg tempera, charcoal, pen, and wash, and oils. The H.M.S. Druid, under Captain Goldsmith, visited Trinidad in 1830 and was painted by the artist on a visit home to his parents. This painting may be one of his earliest surviving paintings. Note the similarity between the arrangement of boat and ship in the picture and that on the ancient seal of our island. The east coast of Trinidad, also known as the Bande de l'Est, was a source of inspiration for several of Casabon's watercolors. This coast that stretches from Toco in the north to Point Galera in the south was considered to be the most remote part of the island. Shown here in this watercolor is the famous cape named Galera by Columbus because it reminded him of a galley under full sail. This area is covered by coconut trees. It is believed that this great coconut plantation was a result of a shipwreck in times long past of a cargo of nuts bound from Africa for Brazil. Iron ships began to appear powered by steam. The ships also carried sails as a precaution. The SS Atlantis was painted in watercolor and seems strangely modern for those times. A brown-skinned beauty dressed in the style of the French islands with foulard, madras hair tie, gold earrings and necklaces. This watercolor tells the story of how deeply the French influence was felt in Trinidad. Indeed, Patois was spoken by almost everyone for more than 150 years after the conquest by the British. St. Anne's was the home of Governor Woodford, who introduced many rare and valuable plants, such as the strangely beautiful nutmeg tree as well as cinnamon and clove bushes. In this delightful watercolor, Casabon captures the atmosphere of a peaceful afternoon. The St. Anne's River murmurs softly to itself through cobblers. The girls, their washing done, enjoy a chat, the air filled with the sounds of nature. At the other end of the town, life there too was cast in a gentler mold. This watercolor of what was once called Cobo Town shows a little of the life of shipbuilding and fishing that went on there. Most of this area is now Wrightson Road, just about where T and Tech stands. This watercolor shows Pesci Estate House, the one that was bought by Governor Woodford in the early 1800s. Woodford was a well-loved administrator who gave to the island many of its cherished parks and gardens. A watercolor of the botanic gardens, where the lovely ladies of the town could promenade, 
a beautiful sight. As the poet Coleridge wrote of one Creole beauty, Soledad, thou wilt never read these lines. Few of those who will can ever know thee, and I shall never see thee again on this side of the grave. Therefore I write thy name, whilst yet remember thy face and hear thy voice, thou sweet and ingenuous girl. Today, little remains of that way of life, and that little survives largely by the grace of those who love and cherish our Creole culture. Not very much is told of the men who opened up the rich valleys of the northern mountains, who carved out for themselves little cocoa kingdoms in the deep green forest. In those days, there was little entertainment to be had on the great estates. So, wonderful instruments, such as this music box called a polyphone, were enjoyed. A truly marvelous piece of clockwork whose haunting strains we now hear would fill the misty valleys of the isolated homesteads of long ago. A knowledge of the past is most necessary if the history of our island is not to be forgotten. Casabon, the painter, like the historian Gustave Bord, the writer and linguist J.J. Thomas, and the musician Lionel Belasco are the illustrious artists of our past, and their work is a legacy to us to learn and to pass on to future generations.